Welcome to Finance in 5. It might be surprising to anyone who hasn't studied history, but revolutions occur very commonly as a result of taxation. When everyone is fat and happy, peace prevails. But when an economy turns down, debt can cause governments to abuse their powers to tax their people. If it gets bad enough, eventually civil unrest springs forth, leading to toppling of a regime. We might not be there right now, but history is our witness that abusive taxation leads to empires, nations, and city-states collapsing and being buried in a common grave. Today, we'll look at the current state of the world and how you should prepare for what inevitably lies ahead, regardless of where you live. Coming up today on Finance in 5. The record coronavirus spending has caused many people to ask the question, how on earth will all of this money be paid back? And sure enough, we're beginning to see some answers. A whole raft of possible tax hikes has been mooted by finance ministers everywhere. The UK Chancellor is expected to increase capital gains, break the pensions triple lock and scrap tax relief on second homes, among other measures. In the US, the Democrats want to tax even trading every financial transaction would be taxed. So what's behind this push for tax increases? Well, we all know, governments have no money. Everything they have comes from us, or is borrowed from future generations. A government only consumes a nation's wealth. They don't create it. And once they spend all they have, they either borrow more or tax more. If they borrow more, they have to tax more to repay that borrowing, except they never repay it. They just use what they collect in taxes as collateral to borrow more. Then they spend more and tax more in an endless loop, which can only stop when it collapses. It took me a while to arrive at this realization. In the past, I consoled myself with thoughts along the lines of, well, I seem to be paying quite a lot of tax here. Luckily though, governments use that tax to help people. That's what I thought. And isn't that what we're all told from a very young age? Pay your taxes. The government is your friend. It's the right thing to do. The right thing to do. Been the right thing to do. We're bringing in masks in England, and that's the the right thing to do. It is also the right thing to do. I did the right thing. That's the right thing to do. The right thing to do. That's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. It has to be done in the right way. It was the right thing to do. They are there to help us all. That's what we're told. They do this many ways. Through infrastructure development, people say, through healthcare, education, policing, through providing pensions. But many government funded programs now are bankrupt. In Chicago, there are more people drawing pensions than there are paying into the pension funds. In the village of Elmwood Park, for instance, there are 122 employees and 396 pensioners. This situation isn't unique to Chicago, but is taking place all over the country and throughout Europe. Governments never funded these pensions, yet voters pinned their hopes to them. So now governments have to borrow and tax in order to meet these obligations. The situation is already out of control. So how do governments raise taxes? Well, they do so via a number of stealth methods, usually leveraging fear and panic as justification. All sorts of taxes are raised simply by reclassifying the taxes or by altering the definitions of who is rich so that more people fall under the umbrella of the higher tax rates. Hunting for assets around the globe simply causes money to contract and hoard. Statues of Roman coins found throughout the world represent the same thing, people sequestering capital away from confiscation by the state. Politicians say that they want to raise taxes on the rich to help the poor. You should be contributing more. Such objectives might sound noble, but all this really does is send money fleeing from that particular economy, taking with it all of the skilled labor and competent incentive-driven people to the point at which all you have left are the poor. Hillary rents a house for a week by the beach for $110,000. Bernie has three houses. Pelosi is worth $120 million, Feinstein $90 million. She will still be getting paid to be a politician in five years time 
At the ripe old age of 92, Obama splashed out on a plush pad in Martha's Vineyard. Former UK Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg bought a mansion in Atherton, Silicon Valley, which just so happens to be the most expensive zip code in California, with a median home value of a beastly $6.66 million. George Osborne has a three million pound ski chalet in Verbier. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having money, not at all. But when you realize that these people are all in it for themselves and that their lifestyles of largesse are entirely taxpayer funded, you find yourself asking what gives them the right to shame Joe Public into parting with ever increasing proportions of their hard earned income. It really doesn't matter what the political party is, time and time again, they see us as easy targets for their robbery, wearing their compassion on their sleeves, sometimes tearfully, by imploring us constantly to pay more tax to help the disadvantaged. To fund what she calls a Green New Deal related to climate change, claiming now that wealthy Americans should be contributing more. But according to a Bloomberg analysis of 2016 tax returns, the top 1% of taxpayers already pay a greater share of income taxes, 37.3%, than the bottom 90% combined. They enrich themselves while lecturing us about how we need to do more. They pursue the public for taxes abusively, which effectively denies us the very opportunities that these politicians took advantage of without batting an eye. I'm pointing out that they are lying when they say that the rich need to pay more tax, because no matter how much is collected, politicians always spend more. In the UK, George Osborne ranted and raved about his predecessor, the Labour Chancellor Ed Balls, leaving a note to say that they spent all the money, yet proceeded to do the very same thing himself, all topped off in 2020 by endless more billions borrowed the world over. It never stops until it collapses. And for all we hear of Warren Buffett extolling the virtues of increasing taxation levels on higher earners. I don't think our tax system is very equitable. It's clear that he wouldn't have been able to accumulate his vast fortune, much less deploy billions of dollars via investments, had he himself not been subject to reasonably low levels of taxation for at least the last half century, which lies in stark contrast to what he is advocating for everyone else. In fact, Let's look at Warren Buffett's personal financial situation right now for a moment since we're on the subject. Buffett's salary was just less than $375,000 in 2019, which is respectable but far from gargantuan for the leader of one of the world's biggest companies. Considering Berkshire's cash flows, he pays himself very little. So does his long-term investing partner, Charlie Munger. Just look at how much more they pay to the vice chairman and senior vice president, Greg Abel and Mark Hamburg, respectively. They pay these guys millions. $375,000 per year is what Warren pays himself. It constitutes less than 1% of his overall income. The reason why he works this cheaply in my humble estimation is because he doesn't want to pay more in tax. What taxes will he pay on that $375,000? Well, with tax rates at 35% between federal and Medicare and taxes for the state of Omaha, probably at least $141,000 depending on what he is able to deduct and whether or not there are any pension contributions. Previously in interviews, Warren has talked about his pension. In the public sector, you know, it's a disaster. If I were relocating into some state that had a huge unfunded pension plan, I'm walking into liabilities because, I mean, who knows whether they're going to get it from the corporate income tax or my employees, uh, you know, with, with personal income taxes or what. And those are big numbers, really big numbers. And they will come after corporations. They'll come after individuals. They, they just, they're going to have to raise a lot of money. The majority of his income comes from investments. He owns a third of the stock of Berkshire Hathaway. The market cap of Berkshire Hathaway is $451.4 billion. The current price to earnings ratio of Berkshire Hathaway is 46.51. So Berkshire trades at 46 and a half times its earnings, which means that every dollar that Warren does not pay himself in salary adds $46.51 to the value of Berkshire Hathaway stock. Since he owns a third of that stock, that's $15.50. So if he doesn't pay himself a dollar, Warren is $15.50 richer. And let's not forget the fact that he owns 1.8 million shares and that each share is worth $278,000. He understands the power of compounding and he leaves large amounts of money in Berkshire each year, legally of course, and he invests. 
So when he decides eventually that he wants to sell that stock, which might never happen, but let's imagine for a moment that eventually he sells it, his capital gains tax rate is what exactly? That's right, because of his salary band, it's 15%. So it's obvious to anyone with a brainstem that Warren Buffett is willfully and deliberately going out of his way to organize his financial affairs so as to minimize his tax liability. I'm just saying, don't believe everything that you read or hear on the news about how rich people aren't paying enough tax or how if only taxes were increased, all of our problems would disappear. No, the problem is not with the taxpaying citizens of this country or of your country, whatever that happens to be. The problem is that governments are addicted to borrowing and never repaying anything. And we are always the tax cattle subject constantly to being tipped upside down and having our pockets emptied by these psychopaths. So what's the solution? Well, it's not to break the law. I'm not saying avoid tax. I'm not saying protest or do anything that will undermine your ability to succeed or to help others to succeed. Maybe the right thing to do is not to complain, but to be patient and to develop endurance. It's not possible for us to change tax policy, but knowing what is coming will help us in some way to stay prepared. We can support each other. We can invest in precious metals. We can work really hard to earn as much as possible because really tax shouldn't be as much of an issue if you're earning a lot. So don't let it become all consuming, but this is just something to be aware of. Recognize when you're told that you need to pay more that maybe you don't and that maybe the government has lost control. Governments never really stay within their budgets. They always borrow more and they always continue to hunt down more in tax, which is why the Chancellor also announced measures for cracking down on tax evasion. In my humble opinion, it would be better rather than having income taxes and rather than paying the wages of those who need to enforce collection of taxes and their pensions, it would be better to completely get rid of income tax and have some kind of consumption tax. It's clear from quite a lot of evidence going back at least three decades that when you do introduce a consumption tax, the rich or those with high levels of disposable income actually have got more money to spend. Therefore, they'll be making high purchases and that is going to bring in the revenue needed by government. It's just one proposal. It's not the only one. We'll see what happens over the next six months, but it's going to be interesting. Anyway, thanks very much for listening. That's it for now. All the very best.